Well, welcome everyone to another day, another nonprofit show. Today is Friday, which means it's an exciting day for us because it's our Ask and Answer series. So this is presented by our exclusive sponsor, Fundraising Academy at National University. And this is one of the really kind of fun shows that we do where we just get to have a dialogue, a conversation, and explore some questions from our audience and from our viewers um, who write in and send us questions. These are like the things that are, are most pressing, most dire to them, and they are looking for an expert's advice and opinion on them. And so today we have a special guest. We have Muhi Kwaja. Um, Muhi comes to us from National University's Fundraising Academy. He's also the co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation. So Muhi's calling in today from Costa Rica. Tell us, Muhi, we were just talking about it in the green room, but tell us uh, what you're doing there for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, just taking advantage of working remotely, uh, traveling with my fiance through the summer, uh, and we are excited to go through Costa Rica for a few weeks and then bounce around to Peru, uh, possibly a few other countries and Brazil. Uh, so keeping the plans flexible, um, but figuring it out as long as long we go. I just absolutely love that. Like if you're going to travel, that's the way to do it. And I guess if you're going to work remotely, what better way to work than to, you know, be able to be on the road at all times. So this is not new for you, is it? You travel frequently, uh, you know, throughout the year. Uh, yeah, about two years ago, I did four months in Latin America. Um, and last year I was doing Europe and Asia. So, um, you know, very blessed and fortunate to make it work. Um, it's definitely challenging in some ways. Uh, and, you know, it's not a permanent vacation, but you're still squeezing in some fun activities while you're working. So, yeah. <laughs> well, tell us, Muhi, a little bit about what you do professionally. Uh, so, as you see here, co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation. I am their chief development officer. Uh, help families distribute their charitable giving through donor advised funds. I also help nonprofit organizations create endowments to be more sustainable. Um, so we've distributed $20 million since 2017. Um, and I lead our part-time staff and team. We're a small operation, but we make it work. Uh, and at Fundraising Academy, I get the pleasure of working with you and a few others that are part of uh, the training staff, and we host webinars on a monthly basis. We just had our awesome Cultivate Conference, uh, so we get to put on a lot of professional development opportunities for nonprofit leaders. That is right. I was like, what an incredible week last week. So Muhi and I were both out in San Diego together for the whole week for uh, National University's fundraising um, Cultivate Conference. And it was my first conference with, with Cultivate. It was not Muhi's first, but wow, was it an incredible week. We had like a ton of great speakers. Well, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do here today. Um, so to introduce myself, for those of you who are watching us, many of you may know me by now. My name is Meredith Terry, and I'm one of your co-hosts here at the Nonprofit Show. Uh, we recently had a uh, brought on a number of new co-hosts, so you'll be seeing all of us much more frequently over the coming weeks here. We want to give particular thanks and shout out to our sponsors. We wouldn't be here without you all. Uh, many of our sponsors have been with us from the very beginning. So special thanks to Bloomering, nonprofit, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Okay, my friend, are you ready to get started on the questions we have sent in on our special ask and answer series? Let's dive in. Okay, let's do it. So this first one is sent in from Richard from Cincinnati, Ohio. Richard writes in and says, it has been suggested that we create a minimum amount that each board member is required to fundraise annually. Can you shed some light on this? As it is, I feel that this would make it even harder to cultivate new board members. 
So I am particularly interested, Muhi, on your feedback here, your thoughts and your insight. I've got some of my own opinions on this one, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah, you know, through Fundraising Academy, we often get this question a lot as well. And we've done different webinars on supercharging your board for fundraising. Um, and similarly, it's always a topic of interest, whether you're looking at the nonprofit Happy Hour Facebook group or you're at AFP Icon. Uh, I think there's a lot of thought leadership and trying to shift the needle on this. And it may be generationally different from what has been done and where things are going as a trend. I think that moving forward, you will see this more as a common practice. And in terms of how board members are engaged with fundraising, that's the secret sauce. So you want to make sure that all board members are participating in the process, whether they are simply identifying prospects or actively making introductions or even being the one to help the development staff close the gift. So there are a variety of ways and each board member is going to be comfortable in a different way to help out. It's up to the development staff to coach the board members and be there as a resource uh, to make that process a lot more smoother. Um, so at AMCF, I can tell you, we put it in the job description. We say that it's an expectation that you will be helping give or get $5,000 annually. Um, so people interpret that in different ways. Some simply can have the luxury of writing that check. And some go beyond that as well to have family members and friends also contribute during our Ramadan fundraiser or year-end fundraiser. Uh, and we have others that are more stretched financially, so they can't make their own significant a large gift, but they can make a gift that is meaningful to them, even if it's $50. We just want 100% participation and then encouraging their networks to be supporting us as well. And it can come through the form of a sponsorship or in any other means. Okay, so so many things you said here that I think are really, really important. Um, so the first one being, you know, um, having that that board engagement, that's really what this boils down to, right? You kind of hit the nail on the head and said, it's really comes down to, you know, how engaged your board members are, how much they're participating, and are they helping and assisting with your development's efforts? So, you know, to your point, some of us have give or get policies. You also use that term give or get. So that's one that I have heard most frequently. And I think that's kind of what Richard is asking us about here from Cincinnati, right? This idea of a give or get policy. I will tell you, I'm in, I'm in big favor of it. Um, that may be an unpopular opinion to some. I've, I've also received some feedback before from individuals who tend to think that maybe stipulating a minimum give or get might stifle donations because folks are likely to just write the check for the minimum. So in your case, you gave an example and said it's $5,000. What do you think there? Do you think that folks would be more likely to give more if you didn't specify a minimum? Do they write a check for 5,000 because that's the number you asked for? If you hadn't asked for that number, might they write a check for 10,000? Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, in our experience, we've seen some board do more uh, and some do less than that. And again, it's really dependent on their means. Um, so it's in alignment with, you know, if they're serving on the board, is this a top three gift that they're making? Um, are they that passionate about it to be a major gift donor to the organization? Uh, and do they have the linkage, interest, ability uh, an involvement to be able to do that. So it's an individual conversation. Um, and definitely in our experience, we've had some that have given more than the minimum requirement and some that um, get the $5,000 commitment. Um, and, you know, the old adage of give, get, or get off. 
Um, yeah. So there's has to be conversations around if somebody isn't being effective in their fundraising duties, um, is that enough justification to see how they can contribute? And maybe they're a value add in a different way. Maybe they're really strong in marketing or really strong in HR, uh, and you still want to retain them uh, for those areas of expertise, but uh, maybe not on a development committee or in a way that has yeah. to do with, you know, play to their strengths, essentially. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on this one. I think that um, I think it's critical that you stipulate. The other thing you said that I absolutely love is and very much agree with is that you put it in the job description as a role responsibility or an expectation of new board members. I mean, be clear and transparent with them from the start. I mean, this is this is the value that you bring to us on our board. Um, it's fine if they bring other skill sets. In fact, it's encouraged that they bring other skill sets, but we absolutely want them to be contributing as donors as well. I mean, it, when you go to write any grant or secure any donation from another funder, I mean, one of the top questions that they want that they want answered is, you know, what percentage of your board is giving? So totally agree with you on this one, Muhi. Let's see what our next question it has in store for us. This one comes to us from Jackie in Seattle, Washington. Jackie writes in and says, I am beginning to think the board does not truly understand how to read the financial reports that we provide at each meeting. They seem to glance over them, not ask questions, and then kind of rubber stamp them. I'm not sure how to fix this. Can you give me some ideas? Sounds like we are on the topic of board, the theme of board members today. So what are your thoughts about this one, Muhi? Yeah, you know, I really like this because even in my, you know, 15 plus years of nonprofit management and fundraising experience and working with boards and leadership, I would say this is an area in which I myself can become stronger. Um, so financial literacy, financial management, of course, I can put a budget together. I can understand looking at a 990 or a profit and loss sheet or a balance sheet. But to really dive into it, I, you know, I consider myself like an intermediate. I'm not like an expert on it. I can get by. So when I think of what would be helpful for me, I would say even if there's like a finance 101 that the board can do for the organization and everybody who is putting that rubber stamp on it has to attend, even if it's a 20 minute training um, or when you are putting together the board meeting minutes, maybe the finance chair puts together a uh, under three minute video verbally explaining everything and saying, you know, on cell C6, this means X, Y, and Z. Um, so really boiling it down in layman's terms so that everybody understands what is being uh, approved. Um, I know those are things that would be helpful for me. Um, and I don't think there's any shame in bringing it down to that level um, if you feel like everybody needs to have like a certain level of base and understanding and then you can go more complex as you continue to engage with the board on these things so uh this is one of those topics so it, this was an interesting one as i'm reading through it because last week when we were in san diego for the cultivate conference I actually delivered a session on um, data in nonprofits, right? So we weren't focusing so much on reading or interpreting financial reports, but we were we were talking about this idea of data. So taking a look at numbers, metrics, and then what do we do with it, right? And I think you said something really, really important today, and that was the word training. And you suggested and said, you know, I, I it's probably a good practice, a best practice for organizations to provide their board members with a very basic rudimentary training on how to interpret these financial reports. Not only are they um, helpful from an organizational standpoint or from a fiduciary standpoint, but you know these reports are also really, really important because they kind of gives you an, an indication of the health of your organization, the financial health, um, you know, how well you did this year comparative to last year, 
uh, et cetera. So I, I love that you suggested that we do trainings on this. You know, maybe you bring in, maybe it's your CFO who does a simple training, like you said, records a little screencast video, maybe does a little cheat sheet on the 990 or something. I mean, it could be your CFO. Um, maybe you bring in a consultant who does a board retreat for a day or for a half of a day, kind of teaches folks on the board how to read them. That's something that I can relate to. I mean, financial financial reports, creating them, reading them, it's not my area of expertise, right? As fundraisers, we've become very, very comfortable with data, but you know, creating and preparing financial reports and more importantly, interpreting them is not necessarily our, our area of expertise. So I love it that you suggested that we bring in folks who know how to do it. Yeah, and I think similarly, like, you know, in particular to the board, maybe part of their board orientation process is like, here's a sample 990. This is what this means. And again, you know, you can do a pre recorded 20 minute section on finance for your board members and they watch that video and then they have that level basis of understanding. Uh, and I think where it comes into particular um, experience with fundraising is, you know, we may be putting together a grant proposal and a foundation wants to see a program budget or how is this going to line up with uh, the overall budget of the organization. So having, uh, being able to explain those things, again, in layman terms is really important. Yeah, I could not agree more. I think that, um, Jackie, if you're out there listening to us, take Muhi's advice on this one. Um, the other thing you just said a moment ago, Muhi, that's so critical is the idea of doing a board orientation or training. So um, these are some really good best practices that should, it should be implemented. But, you know, I, I think it's interesting that Jackie noticed um, her just general observation is that, you know, the board members seem to glance over them and rubber stamp them, giving her the perception that perhaps they don't understand or can't interpret them. So um, agree with you on everything you said, Muhi. Let's see what we've got for our next question. Okay, this one comes to us from Marty in Jacksonville, Florida. So Marty writes in and says, if I get professional coaching and it is paid for by my organization, is the coaching confidential? I need some honest feedback and want my coaching to be private. Not sure how this works. Please let me know if I need to be thinking about this before I start with my coach. This is a really interesting topic. I will tell you, this is not a question I've come by before, but as I'm reading through it now, I can see how this is one of those gray areas. Muhi, what do you think about this one? Yeah, you know, I think for executive coaching, professional coaching, if it's being provided by a third party outside of your organization, I would have to imagine that they are signing some sort of contract with not only the organization, but also the individual that they're coaching. I would love to see in these contracts that it is confidential, um, that it is fully for the benefit of the employee as a professional development um, standpoint, something that they can feel comfortable sharing things that won't get back to the employer. Uh, and hopefully that will make the organization itself stronger because the coach can help troubleshoot some of the issues that their staff may be having. Um, so in my experience as well, there were contracts that were signed, and I know that I had full confidence of the professional coach to really bring um, everything that was happening within the organization to the table so that they can provide that advice. So this is one of those really interesting questions. Like we said before, it's kind of a gray area, but you brought up a really, I think, critical uh, observation or opinion here, which is that there's likely a contract somewhere. So if, if your organization has, you know, a partnership, a professional partnership with this coach, there's probably a signed contract somewhere. And um, I think that's probably a good place to start. I would be saying to Marty in this case, or if I were in Marty's shoes, I would be thinking um, the one of the best things you could do is probably to ask this question to your coach. And I think that they're obligated to tell you or to disclose to you if those sessions are not confidential, right? 
I like Muhi said, um, you know, Muhi, you said that you would really like to see something in there, uh, like a confidentiality clause, because, you know, what my question there would be, what good, what good is the coaching if it's not confidential, right? I mean, you want people, the whole focus, the whole point here is that we want people to open up, to be very candid about their experiences, to be very forthcoming about their weaknesses or their shortcomings. And, you know, if, if you feel like everything you're saying is being echoed back to your employer or back to your superior or back to the folks in, in your in your organization that are writing your performance reviews, you might be much less likely to speak candidly. So, yeah, this is a really interesting kind of one of those ethical topics. And I think I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer for this one, but I think that probably the best thing you can do is to ask directly take a look at whatever contract you're signing and uh and and you know be be very you know candid with your coach and your organization that you would like the right to privacy right all righty let's see what we have coming up next this one is comes to us from martha in illinois so martha writes in and says we are trying to reset uh some of our board policies specifically we want to set an age limit and term limits are you familiar with this and what those numbers might look like okay we're back on the board theme again this is this is the dominating theme for today so this is an interesting question borderlines on some possibly touchy subjects here what do you think about this one muhi yeah you know i've heard of it in action. Uh, I haven't seen it implemented, um, but term limits for sure. I think that's an easy no brainer. Um, I think that especially with new organizations that are just starting out, you can set your policies to be favorable and also in hindsight, something that you know you can prevent founder syndrome with as well. Um, when AMCF started, we decided no, uh, you can do two consecutive terms, three years each. Uh, but after that, you have to become a, you know, a non-board member. And if you really wanted, you could join again after a year of stepping off. Um, so we've had some board members that have done the full six years and said adios. We've had some that have done the three, taken a break and come back. We've had some that due to health and family issues couldn't fulfill their three years, um, but we've seen everything in between. We personally don't have an age limit, but I think, you know, if people are of sound mind and in good health, um, I don't think age should be a limitation. I think the issue more so becomes like the founder syndrome or like we've always done it this way mentality and once you come into those issues, I think there are different ways in which you can enforce board limits or policies to help introduce new blood to the organization. So I, I think I totally agree with you here. This is one of those um, touchy subjects that, you know, we... I agree with you on the term limits. That's a best practice without a doubt in nonprofit management, right? To have term limits. Now, this idea of doing age limits, I think is a little more of a touchy subject, right? So I agree with you, Muhi, I think you said it best. If you're of sound mind and you're able to contribute in a meaningful way, then your age is, is maybe not as relevant. Um, and presumably when you're bringing folks onto your board, you're conducting interviews, you're, they're going through a vetting process. I'm not sure that age is even an appropriate question to ask somebody when they're interviewing for a role or for a job. I think that that um, touches on one of those subjects that it, you know, again, is, is a protected class, um, frankly, for discrimination or for anti-discrimination. So I would be really, really cautious about this topic of age limits. Now, to Muhi's point, you know, he gave an example here about um, term limits. And you said with your organization, there are, the governance committee presumably has stipulated in the bylaws that there are, uh, 
three-year terms and you're eligible to complete two three-year terms, so two consecutive three-year terms for a total of six years. At that point, they're required to step off and then possibly can be invited back after they, they get off. That's a really, really good best practice. And I've seen that one uh, before many, many times in various organizations. I've seen some organizations that do three two-year terms for a total of nine years. So you have some flexibility with what you do there. I, I do think that this is a, a an example of a really good best practice, though, to have term limits, because otherwise you might end up with a board that has, you know, uh, members who have been on there for decades. And like Muhi, you said it best, the some of the most dangerous words in the nonprofit industry are because we've always done it this way. Right. And I think you're more likely to fall into that trap when you have the same people on on your staff and on your board and there's really no fresh new ideas coming in. Yeah, and I, I would also recommend like look at who your constituency is. Who are your beneficiaries? Are you working at a senior care organization? Do you have people that are reflective of your organization on your board as your donors? Uh, and what does that look like? So, yeah. you know, even a form of engagement for a donor could be to transition them into becoming a board member and you want to have those paths available. Um, so I think in terms of age limit, like even, you know, don't turn someone away just because they're 18, like they may have different ideas and connections. So I think it goes both ways on the age spectrum. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in uh, age as well. Yeah. Yep, I, I very much agree with you. I think we got to be careful on this topic of age. Well, this was an absolutely fascinating conversation today. There were some really good questions. We seem to have a dominating theme here with the idea of boards, boards of directors, members, um, ethical questions here. I mean, we saw it all. Um, one thing that I, I just want to call attention to everyone is our guest today, um, who is our expert on fundraising, uh, Muhi Kwaja. He comes to us from as a co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. He's also an instructor at National University's Fundraising Academy. Um, so Muhi has a lot of experience in this area and some credi incredible insights and ideas here that he shared with us today. Before we sign out, I want to close this again by thanking our presenting sponsors. We have Bloomerang, nonprofit, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you especially to Muhi for joining us today all the way from Costa Rica. We hope you very much enjoy the rest of your summer and your travels. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you all again on the next nonprofit show.